we're into Advent, okay? And um, uh, I don't know about you, but um, I, I have no idea what Advent was really. Um, I was brought up in a very, very, very low church Pentecostalism, Pentecostal, and anything that smacked of religion we never touched, so Advent was like out the window, apart from chocolate calendars, okay? <laughs> Sausage rolls. Sausage rolls, right, okay. And where I come from, it's chocolate calendars. You have sausage rolls, that's fine. Um, the other thing that about Advent that I always remembered was, as a child, was Valerie Singleton, who I was in love with, making, <laughs> make, making the Advent, Blue Peter Advent candle holder. Okay, and you got the, you had to get the um, coat hangers and you put fire resistant twin, tw- 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 stuff around it, tinsel around it and then you had the little things and you'd lit them one by one. Well, we were so poor we didn't have coat hangers, so. <laughs> it was a window on somebody else's world. Okay, but, um, but we used to, um, you know, you, you, you knew Christmas had come or was starting as soon as Blue Peter did their Christmas candle holder. Do you remember it all, anybody? You all remember that? And um, Christmas shopping started. Um, and, uh, you know, my mother would start to store things and then the game was to find out where everything had been hidden. And, you know, as kids, that's a great excitement until you realise older, when you get older, that spoiled the excitement of Christmas morning. But there you go. That's the way it was. So Advent, for me, has been a bit of a mixed thing. OK. Now, when I talked to my colleagues in the minister's circle, a couple of years ago, I was designing a leaflet for them. And there was this, it was about... Um, the Christmas carol services around the town, and I omitted to put Advent on. Well, it, that would cause quite a stir, okay? How could you miss Advent off? And I said, well, what's Advent? Which caused even more of a stir. <laughs> and then he asked the, the uh, subtle question, because you know how subtle I can be, was, do you think the ordinary Joe Blow on the street actually knows what Advent is? Do they care? Does anybody really care about it? Other than all the things I've already told you about. And um, so, in the end, I relented and we put Advent on. Everybody was happy and, um, and off we go. But Advent, I've, I've been thinking much more about it recently, about what it actually means and what it's all about. And um, we're going to do, over the next two or three weeks, we're just going to look at some things about Advent, uh, which maybe as a church we're not used to because we don't really celebrate Advent. But actually, we're missing something really important. Something really important. Okay, I'm not ready yet to talk about Lent. Okay, so giving things up isn't my style, um, but we're not, uh, we're not there yet. But Advent, so what is actually Advent about? Well, Advent really is about anticipation, getting ready for, being prepared, okay? And it's being prepared for this Christmas, getting ready. That's one of the things, it's an immediate thing. But there's a much subtler message about Advent, and that is that actually we prepare ourselves for the coming of the King into our hearts. It's a time when traditionally Christians have spent time thinking about how do I receive Jesus into my heart, into my life, okay? And obviously we get to Christmas morning and there's the baby Jesus and that's part of it. And then there's a third subtlety which I'd never considered and that is that we're anticipating the return of Jesus, okay? And we spend time, or we're meant to spend time traditionally as Christians thinking about the return of Jesus. This is not just about a baby in a manger, it's about a king who returns. And I think I'm starting to realize that over my life, I've missed something really quite important um, about the whole thing. So I'm thinking a little bit more about it and that's, that's my own personal story, but this is what we're looking at now. We're in that season of Advent when we're thinking about the arrival of a baby, how I receive him in my heart, and the return of a king. Okay, that's what Advent's about. So this morning, we're going to look at a scripture from the Old Testament that starts to talk about these different aspects of of Advent. And if you've got your Bibles with you, if you could turn to Genesis chapter 3. Okay, and um, we're going to be looking at the story 
of Adam and Eve, the serpent, and God's response to it all. So I'm going to just read, really, I'm going to be focusing on uh, verse 14 and 15. But you know the story. And, uh, God's been creating, God created everything, um, he, heavens and earth, the animals and everything else. And every single day, at the end of it, he looked at his creation and said, that's good. I've done a good job. It's brilliant. And we're told in um, chapter 2 and beginning of verse, uh, chapter 3 that God had created man and they were in this peaceful, loving, um, harmonious relationship. God would meet with them in the cool of the evening. They would talk and they would uh, spend time with God. God's presence was absolutely and totally present with them in a very tangible way. And things looked hunky-dory. And it was good. And then we have this serpent who appears on the scene. And in verse 1 of chapter 3, it tells us that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. It doesn't tell us very much more about him other than he was crafty, subtle, deceptive. And he starts to talk to the woman. And the, the question that he asks her is, did God say? Did God really mean it? Did God really say that? If you do that, if you eat of this tree, did God really mean that he would punish you? Surely. Now we hear echoes of that in our society today. It goes like this. If God loves you, why would he punish you? If God loves you, why would he send you to hell? What a strange thing for a loving God to do. Did God really mean it when he said, that um, either you trust my son and everything's, you know, you know you're going to uh, be with him, part of the kingdom, living in heaven. Or did God really mean that actually anybody and everybody, no matter what we do, we're all going to end up in heaven with him? We hear it today. It's there in our society. It's not very subtle these days. Okay, but it is still there. And the serpent asks these questions. And Eve eats of the fruit... And then she gives it to Adam, and Adam eat, eats of the fruit, and suddenly they realise they're naked. And then they hear, hear the sound of the Lord God coming in the evening, and um, in the cool of the night, and they decide to hide themselves. And God calls out to them, where are you, Adam? Where are you? And Adam replies that he was afraid, he was naked, he hid, hides himself, and... Then man commits the ultimate crime, really, I think, in one sense. He, 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 he doesn't take responsibility for what he's done. He says, that woman you gave me, it's not my fault. Guys, we need to understand this story tells us that we need to take responsibility for our actions as men, as fathers, as husbands. It's no good saying it's somebody else's fault. This is just now, sorry, I'm zoning in on gentlemen for a minute. So, gentlemen, you need to take responsibility. It is not acceptable to say it was somebody else's fault. God doesn't deal in that sort of way. It's about responsibility. Anyway, that's a side issue. That's not in my notes. Sorry, that's a bit of a digression. And then he says to the woman, what have you done? And she says, the serpent deceived me. And then we get to verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you will go, and the dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your heel, uh, sorry, bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. To the woman he said, Surely I will multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you will not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So that's a great, uh, great verse for the Advent, isn't it, for Christmas? Do you feel blessed already? Luther said of the Old Testament 
And we've heard a lot about Luther over the last few weeks. But Luther said of the Old Testament, um, he said, the Old Testament is the cradle in which lies the Christ. Okay? So we're coming to think about, in the next couple of weeks, a baby in a manger. Luther says, the Old Testament is the manger in which lies the Christ. In other words, on every page, in every verse, in every story, we can find the Christ. He's in there. Okay? Everything in the Old Testament is pointing to one thing, and one thing only, and that's the first arrival of Jesus. Okay? And what that brings. And then, ultimately, the second coming of Jesus and all that that brings. And so when we read in the Old Testament, which I hope you do, um, but we, we should be looking for, what is this story telling us about Jesus? What does this tell us about what's going to happen? What does this tell us about the coming king? So, uh, just as a side issue, I want you to notice that in, in what I've just read, God does not curse man and woman. He only curses the serpent. Okay, it's quite important. We are not cursed as human beings. We are made in the image of God. And God loves that image. And he wants to restore that image to what it ought to be. Okay, but the serpent, he curses. Now, in Greek, I want to stop for a second, just take a little bit of a detour. In uh, Greek thinking, which um, we are very, very, uh, whether we know it or not, we're very heavily influenced by, but in Greek thinking, there's um, the whole thing of the inner battle that takes place in man, of good and evil, okay? And in Greek thinking, in, um, you know, sort of six centuries, sorry, six, five, four or five thousand years ago in the Greek um, empire, and you think of all the great Greek philosophers, what they taught was that there's an inner struggle that goes on, an equal struggle between good and evil. Okay, and I can choose which one I'm going to sit on and be part of. Oh, as I, when I was growing up as a Christian, a young, young man, um, the way it went was this, that it was almost like, and I, I remember these fuzzy felt things. You remember fuzzy felt Bible stories? Anybody remember those when you were at Sunday school? <coughs> and he went like this. On the fuzzy felt, there was an image of man. And on one side, there would be the devil. And on the other side, there'd be Jesus. Okay, do you, do you, does anybody remember that story? Okay, maybe it was just the church I went to. But that's what they were kind of getting into, that, that the devil would tempt me, and I'd kind of be tempted. And then Jesus would talk to me and stop me and I'd kind of shuffle across and then the devil said no that's fine and there's this in, this constant battle in between good and evil doing right and wrong okay and um, it, it basically it's a Greek philosophy and again we see that in our society we don't recognize it but that's what it is so I want you to bear that in mind as we go through this story and we look at this text so we want to first of all talk about what is the seed that God is talking about to the serpent and to Eve. Okay? And as ever with Bible, when you look at the Bible, it means different things at different times. So there's the immediate issue of Eve's immediate seed, Cain and Abel. There's the immediate issue of these two sons that are going to be born and one is going to murder the other. Okay, there's already set up in the story, in the next two or three chapters, the outworking of Adam and Eve's sin is the immediate murder of one of their children. Okay, there's a, the, the seed is immediate. You can read it on that level and say that's, it, that's, that's what that applies to. And it would be accurate. There's a second thing about the seed. And that is that actually, um, if you read further on in the story of Genesis, suddenly when Abraham is talking to God, God says to him, your seed will be like the stars in the sky. It'll be like the, 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 the sand on the beach. You'll not be able to count it. Okay, And you can interpret this text very legitimately as looking at the seed of, of the Jewish nation that, that, that um, 
ultimately God's plan was for a, a nation that would bring God's kingdom onto earth. Okay, you can legitimately read into that. You can also legitimately read into it that this is foretelling about another seed that's coming which is bigger than a nation. Okay, now we look at it from our context and we can see and agree that actually this is talking about Jesus. That Jesus is coming. And here's, here's the ultimate seed from which this story is now going to be um, acted out. And then there's a further way of looking at it, and if you get into the New Testament, that we are now in that seed. We are included in. You could look at it as the whole humanity. We're not told, it just says it's a seed. But I'm going to focus on three things, really. I'm going to focus on the Jewish nation, on Jesus, and on us. And hopefully, we'll get through that. So, here's this, this curse that God's put on the serpent to tell him that there's going to be enmity, there's going to be war, there's going to be strife, there's going to be tension between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. So, how does that work out? Well, in the Old Testament, I think there's something about the Christmas story which I, every time I come to it, I think... That's true, and that is that Satan's first plan is to kill babies. Okay, Moses. Moses is, you know, what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh tries to wipe out a nation, not by killing all the adults, but by killing the babies. Get rid of the babies. Get rid of the babies, and the nation stops. Later on, it's the same story with Jesus. What does Herod do in the story? Instead of trying to find all sorts of things, it's very easy. Kill the babies. Get rid of them. What about the church? I've just told you about a church plant down in Blackpool. Do you know what? Do you know what? It's easier to kill a church plant than it is to kill a church. Kill it while it's young. Kill it while it's young. Get in first. And here we have Adam and Eve... And the first thing that happens is kill it while it's still young. Get rid of it. And when we look at the, at the Old Testament, the story of the people of God, it, it goes through this cycle of, of newness and, and awareness and things going on. And, and then it settles into a pattern of sin. And then something new happens. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah is, goes back to build the city. What, what, do we, what do we know about Nehemiah? Well, we know that Nehemiah was building a wall with a trowel in one hand and a spear in the other. Because actually, if you can stop the city being built, then we can stop the nation being built. Okay, Satan's tactic. You think about, think about new Christians. How many people have we known over the years that have, have given their life to Jesus and it all looks wonderful and within weeks it's all gone? Okay. There's a very clear tactic with the people of God. Kill it. Get rid of it. Expunge it from the earth. Satan crushing the seed. Okay, now, it's very interesting that this word actually, uh, bruising, can be translated, or should be translated perhaps, as striking. Striking. Like a snake strikes... Striking. And whenever God starts to do something new in the old page of the Old Testament, if you look very carefully, it's not very long before there's a strike. Kill it. Get rid of it. Okay? And we could go all through the history of the, the people of God, and there it is. Just look. You watch. Every time God does something new, Strike, kill, destroy, get rid of. And then we come to Jesus. As I've already said, Herod's initial policy, 
strike, kill, get rid of. And you read through Jesus' story, which is an exciting story, but all the way through, a number of times it says, and they plotted to kill him, plotted to get rid of him, plotted, strike. And Satan knows God's moving. Now, we must be careful. Um, I don't believe that Satan has foreknowledge, because I think that's what God has. But I do believe Satan is not stupid. Okay, he's as capable as I am of reading the promises about the, the Messiah coming. He knows them better than I do. He knows that the Messiah is coming. And the Messiah is going to bring bad news to his kingdom. And he does everything he can to get rid of it. He goes and strikes him mentally, takes him to the top of a large cliff and says, if you, fall yourself, if you throw yourself off here, God will save you, surely. Same tactic as in the garden. Didn't God say he would do that? Well, it's in the Psalms. It said it would. He attacks him physically. You know, after 40 days, Jesus is hungry and Satan tempts him. Why don't you try? Why don't you turn that stone into bread? Why don't you just do that? Striking. Tempting. If he can bring the Messiah down, if he can bring this Jesus down before anything else happens, he's won. And then you get to the cross. The ultimate strike. I think that Satan must have been when all his, Christmas, all his Christmases come at once. He's got this man who says he's the Messiah on a cross. Dead. Strike. <laughs> Finished. And the serpent is, in this story, is being told there's going to be, there's going to be an enmity. You can strike. You will do that. And Jesus is dying, he's dead on a cross and laid in a tomb. And oh, how that must have felt for those satanic hosts. What a party they must have had that night. All their Christmases come together, if I can use that phrase, all in one go, all their birthdays, every Easter, everything thrown in together. Big party. This man who calls himself the Messiah is dead. I'll come back to that in a minute. What about the church? So the church is now, after post-resurrection, is, is very vulnerable. It's sitting in an upper room waiting for something to happen. Scared, silly, won't go out because they're terrified they're going to be killed. And the Holy Spirit comes on them, and they go out and start preaching the gospel. And it's remarkable, 4,000 or 3,000, 5,000, you read through the book of Acts, thousands of people becoming Christians, receiving Jesus. And what is the response? There's a strike. Okay? Stephen. Stephen is... An innocent man serving the church. What happens to him? Fear comes in the church. Stephen is, is martyred. Paul goes on his persecution. What's, what's Saul trying to do? He's trying to stop the church before it even gets going. Satan's plan. Strike. And that doesn't work. It starts to grow and grow. And AD 72 comes round. And the temple is wrecked by the Romans. And the church is persecuted again. Striking. Striking. They're sent around the globe, known globe. Scattered. And wherever they go, they're persecuted. The Romans didn't like them. The Jewish Jews blamed them. Nero burns them. Paul ends up in prison. Striking. When um, a new church plant starts, I guarantee you that at some point, something happens. Sin enters in. 
something happens, strikes. Because it's easier to kill a church when it's young than when it's mature. When it gets mature, and we're getting to be a mature church, actually what happens is complacency sets in. There's no reason to kill the church. There's not much, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I get tired, not much enthusiasm, stop caring a little bit, stop getting involved a little bit. That's the sin, that's the issue that we strike, we face. It's complacency. It's not the, we've got 15 enthusiastic 25-year-olds who are all on fire for Jesus. It's a different thing. But there's a strike. And we're constantly at war. And then there's me. What about you? When I find that I'm, God touches me and I'm suddenly getting on fire for God again and things burn, it's not very long before something happens. Strike. Some situation, some financial thing, somebody upsets me. Something gets in my way. Something I wasn't expecting. God's been good, he's given me this, and the next minute it's been taken away. Strike. We are not exempt from the strikes of certain. Okay, we're not. It doesn't work that way. If I actually, as soon as I put my hand up and say I'm following Jesus, guess what Jesus says? Trouble's coming, guys. So I was, oh, where's um, Madison, Madison's down at the cafe? She's got a T-shirt on today. It says, I don't go looking for trouble. It usually comes to find me. Okay? When Madison comes back in, that's a prophetic word for you and me. Okay? Do you know what? When I became, put my hand up and became a Christian, I didn't need to go and find sin. Sin was crouching at my door. It's waiting. I don't need to go and find a demon to get into trouble with. It comes to find me and tempts me and, and, and strikes away at me. I don't need to go looking for trouble. It finds me. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, trouble's on its way. Do you feel kind of uplifted and encouraged right now? No, this is like <laughs> depressing. Well, let's look at it the other direction. Because it says, and he will bruise your head. And that word bruise, it says bruise in my version, the ESV. Um, having said what I said about the King James last, year, last week, actually King James translates that quite accurately. It says in the King James, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This promise is what theologians call the proto-evangelum the first evangelistic story, the first bit of good news that there is in the new story. And yes, there's going to be strikes, but it says that the seed of the, of the woman is going to crush Satan's head. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, no matter how many times Satan strikes at the, the uh, Jewish nation, God has a plan. God has a rescuer. God has a man or a woman who comes and rescues the nation and takes them to the next stage. God already has provision for them. And uh, so, you know, let's get rid of Moses. But actually, as Moses grows, he, he does all the stupid things that he does. But actually, he's known for the man who brings out the people of Israel from out of slavery. He brings them out. He takes them to the promised land or on the edge of the promised land. And he's known for all the things that he did that, that, that followed what God was saying. Whenever you see a story in the Old Testament where Satan strikes, there's always a provision for a man or a woman to come and take it on further. God has already dealt with the issue. How do we know that? Well, 4,000 years on, we still have Jewish nation. We still have Jewish believers. They're still there. No matter how many times Satan has tried to strike them, God has a plan for them. We're told in Romans that God has a plan for them. It's not finished. It's still there. Things to do. People to see. And God, all the way through, he defeats Satan in so many different ways. How does he do that? Well, here's one. Let's walk around the, the city for seven times and blow our trumpets. 
It's God provision. Do you think that blowing trumpets is going to pull down a city? The people of God were simply doing what God had told them. God provided. God did it. And we could go through the Old Testament and go through all that. But we left Jesus on a cross. And for me, this is the most exciting thing. Because there he is in his grave. Satan's having a party. And God, the Father, looks at Jesus, the Son, and sees no sin in him. He sees no issue. Jesus is pure and righteous and clean and just. And God, through the power of the Spirit, raises him from the dead. And Jesus, three days later, comes out of the tomb. The strike has not been permanent. It was fatal. Jesus did die. But it wasn't permanent. Because in God's provision, the Saviour that comes to us at Christmas as a little baby and grows into a young man is God's provision to strike and crush Satan's head. And Jesus is raised from the dead and he, he visits his people and he's around for 40, 50 days and he talks to them and he dwells with them and no matter what Satan could throw at him in those three days in the tomb, Jesus is raised from the dead. No matter what accusations, no matter what was trying to hold him down, death couldn't hold him. He's raised triumphant from the grave. And in the baby that we're going to celebrate in four weeks' time is the promise of resurrection life that we can have. It's amazing. It's amazing. God, God on earth, God in the flesh, dwelling among us, goes to a cross and because of his purity and righteousness, he crushes Satan's head, never to be defeated again, never to have that strike again. Satan is crushed in the resurrection, totally and utterly crushed. The end is nigh. Okay? His days are now numbered. Oh yes, he's got freedom to go and create trouble for us. He creates trouble for the church. He creates trouble for the people who love Jesus. But you know what? His, his days are numbered. He's crushed. It's finished. That's why Jesus on the cross, one of the reasons he stands on the cross, it is finished. No longer do these strikes cause fear and death and misery. No longer do I have to live as a chained prisoner to the things that surround me. No longer do I have to uh, be blind to the truth. No longer do I have to be dead to the resurrection life. Because it is finished. The strike, though fatal, wasn't permanent. So what about me and my situation? Well, I don't know about you, I'm in my mid-50s. That means I've got a lot of baggage. Okay, that means there's stuff happened to me that causes me pain, causes me suffering, causes me issues. There's stuff that I've done that causes me pain and causes me issues. And the stuff that I've done that may cause you pain or others pain and issues, that's because I'm a human being. That's the way it works. And certain striking at me constantly through guilt and fear, condemnation, disabling me to do the things that God wants me to do because of something I've said. I recently, um, I was pondering on something that happened about 20 years ago and something, that, a situation, and I was pondering on my responsibility in it. And I started to feel the guilt of that and the weight of it and the awfulness of what had happened and really feeling very condemned. And what does that do to me? That's a strike of certain, but what does it do? It, it disarms me. It disables me. It stops me from doing what God wants me to do. 
Interestingly enough, that thought occurred and started to buzz around just at the beginning of the year when we're talking about getting on a new train. I feel like I'm not, I started to feel, well, perhaps I'm not able to get on that train because I'm not actually good enough to get on that train because of what happened. It's subtle. It's deceptive. It comes with a smack of truth around it. Because you know what? I did have responsibility. And yes, there are times when I should feel guilty about that, or did feel guilty about it. But it's a strike of certain, subtle, but it's still a strike. But in my life, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and I've been set free from all that guilt and condemnation, all the stuff that comes with it. I'm no longer a slave to all that, because Jesus has crushed Satan's head. And I am free to be the child of God that he meant me to be. I am free to be the person that God wants me to be. We've heard it already this morning from Romans. I don't have to live in the, I was going to say good of, but in the shadow of the things that happened in the past. I can live in the goodness of God's Freedom life for me. I have been set free for freedom's sake so that I can pursue God and become more and more like him. My finances. As you all know, because I've told you before about what a mess we got into our finances because of a business decision that went wrong. And you know what? Even now that echoes through to us. So recently we had to move house, and uh, we're renting because we can't get a mortgage. And the very first thing I have to tell this state agent is, just so you know, five years ago, this happened, and um, when you go to the credit check, you'll find this, this, and this. Okay, it echoes through. And there are times, certainly when we were moving the last couple of weeks, I thought to myself, this is my fault. I did this. What a wretched man I am. What an awful husband. What a terrible father. And you get into that slough of pit of despondency. Okay, and I have to stand and say, no, that's not true. It may be true that it's my fault and I take responsibility for it, <coughs> but I've been set free from the guilt of all that and the condemnation. And actually, I don't care what the world thinks because Jesus says, I've been set free. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't have to live in the guilt of it. I don't have to live... And no matter how Satan subtly strikes, the truth is that Jesus has crushed his head. And what does that mean for me? It means that I, too, am a certain stomper. In America, I don't know if you know, but in America, you can buy... Um, vans, you know, the shoes, and there's a, a little slot for a picture of your pastor you can put in the front, and they're called certain stompers, and you can kind of make it real, okay? Americans. <laughs> what can you say? Happy holiday, by the way. Happy holiday. Listen, joking aside, the truth is that we, as a church, we as individuals, we are certain stompers. We are the seed through which we also can say, this is not true. I am free. And every time we say, I am free to do this. I'm free to do that. I'm free from condemnation. I'm free from guilt. I'm free from judgment. Every time we do that, we're stomping on Satan's head. Crushing his head. I'm going to close. If you turn to Revelation, because this is the end of the story. This proto evangelum, the first good news. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read, because this is just brilliant. We're in chapter 19. This is the end of the story. This is the ultimate. Crushing down. This is not Greek theology where it's equal. It's never been equal. It's never been a fair fight. 
Okay? It, there's never been a time when will good overcome evil or will evil overcome good. There's never been a period like that, ever. Because even in the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, God lays down the victory line that's coming. There's never been a point. Even at the cross, Satan was defeated. Chapter 19. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he's judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and forever. And the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! From the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. That's us. We're part of that great multitude. Like the roar of many waters and the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made, himself, made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Every time you do a righteous deed, you're fulfilling the scripture. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges, and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were fallen him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of, the God, of God to eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, great and small. And I saw the beast and the kings of heaven, of earth, the beast. This morning's preach is called the dragon slayer. The dragon slayer. I saw the beast and the kings of earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who were sitting on a horse and against his army. Even at the last, they're there to strike the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he was deceived, who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And the two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him, who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Verse 7 of chapter 20. When the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were. And they were tormented day and night forever and forever. Do you know what? I could carry on reading the whole passage. This is the victory of our Jesus. Way, way back, Adam and Eve mess up completely and the serpent is told there's going to be enmity between his seed and the woman's seed. That he will strike the heel but his head will be crushed. We get into the book of Revelation, we see 
that's exactly what's going to happen. It's never been a fair fight. When you face your situations this week, whatever it may be, the strike may be fatal, but the result is not permanent. There'll never, ever, ever be a day when Satan fights on certain, the same terms as the Son of God, because God himself has decreed that he will crush Satan's head, and we have the authority. In fact, actually, what does the Bible say? It says that he goes around roaring like a lion, like a toothless lion. Like, without belittling the situation, but like the lion in the, um, I was going to say gone with wind. It's not gone with wind. Yellow Brick Road. The Wizard of Oz. A toothless lion. When you face your situations, you as a child of God can say, I'm free to be who I want to be. Let's just stand, pray, and we're going to finish. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you have, even in the very beginning, you created and you set the story that it was going to be a, a great victory over a great enemy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In my life right now, who can separate me from the love of God? Nothing can. If my God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have, through your death and resurrection, set off a, a, a chain of events which means that I can be free to be the child of God that you want me to be. Lord, as we go out into the week, would you help us to be the person that you intended us to be, set free from guilt and condemnation, set free from the past, set free as a prisoner, set, set free from the things that have bound us over the years, from habits and thoughts. We are free from those. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can crush the, the, the head of the enemy in our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we do this, Lord, not because of our strength, but because of everything that Jesus did on the cross, through everything that the Holy Spirit brings to us on a day basis. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.